Act One of London Assurance by Diane Bosico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sir Harcourt Courtley, read by Andrew James. Charles Courtley, read by Caveat. Dazzle, read by Adrian Stevens. Max Harkaway, read by Todd. Mr. Adolphus Dolly Spanker, read by Alan Mapstone. Cool, read by Thomas Peter. Mark Medal, read by Andrew Gauntz. Mr. Solomon Isaacs, read by Larry Wilson. Martin, read by Wayne Cook. James Simpson, Butler, read by Tchaikovsky. Lady Gay Spanker, read by Kelly Taylor. Grace Harkaway, read by Elise D. Per, read by Colleen McMahon. Stage directions, read by Mike Manalakis. London Assurance, Act One. Scene, an anteroom in Sir Harcourt Courtley's house in Belgrave Square. Enter Cool, Center. Half past nine. And Mr. Charles has not yet returned. Oh, I am in a fever of dread. If his father happens to rise earlier than usual in any morning, he is sure to ask first for Mr. Charles. Poor deluded old gentleman. He little thinks how he is deceived. Enter Martin, lazily, left. Well, Martin, he has not come home yet. No, and I've had not a wink of sleep all night. I cannot stand this any longer. I shall give warning. This is the fifth night Mr. Courtney has remained out, and I'm obliged to stand in the hall window to watch for him. You know, if Sir Harcourt was aware that we connived at his son's irregularities, we should all be discharged. I have used up all my common excuses on his duns. Call again, not at home, and send it down to you. Won't serve any more. And Mr. Crust... The wine merchant swears he will be paid. So they all say. Why, he has a rest sat against him already. I've seen the fellows watching the door. Loud knock and ring heard left. There he is, just in time. Quick, Martin, for I expect Sir Harcourt's bell every moment. Bell rings right. And there it is. Exit Martin, slowly, right. Thank heaven. He will return to college tomorrow, and this heavy responsibility will be taken off my shoulders. A valet is as difficult a post to fill properly as that of Prime Minister. Exit. Left. Young Courtly. Without. Hello! Dazzle. Without. Steady! Enter. Young Courtly and Dazzle. Left. Hello! Hush! What are you about? Howling like a hot and tot? Sit down there and thank heaven you are in Belgrave Square instead of Bow Street. Damn Bow Street! Oh, with all my heart! You have not seen as much of it as I have. I say, let me see. What was I going to say? Oh, look, here. Pulls out a large assortment of bell pulls, knockers, etc. from his pocket. There, damn me. I'll puzzle the two-penny postman. I'll deprive him of their right of disturbing the neighbourhood. That black lion's head did belong to old vampire the moneylender. This bell pull to Miss Stitch, the milliner. And this brass griffin. That? Oh, let me see. I think I twisted that off our own hall door as I came in, while you were paying the cab. What shall I do with them? Pack him in a small hamper and send him to the city magistrate with my father's compliments. In the meantime, come into my room and I'll astonish you with some burgundy. Re-enter Cool, center door. Cool, right. Mr. Charles? Young Courtly, center. Out, out, not at home to anyone. And drunk. As our lord. If Sir Harcourt knew this, he would go mad. He would discharge me. You flatter yourself. That would be no proof of his insanity. To Dazzle, left. This is Cool, sir. Mr. Cool, he is the best liar in London. There is a pungency about his invention and an originality in his evocation. It is perfectly refreshing. Cool, aside. Why, Mr. Charles, where did you pick him up? You mistake. He picked me up. Bell rings, right. Here comes Sir Harcourt. Pray do not let him see you in this state. State? What do you mean? I'm in a beautiful state. I should lose my character. That would be a fortunate epoch in your life, Cool. Your father would discharge me. Cool, my dad is an old ass. Retire to your own room for heaven's sake, Mr. Charles. I'll do so for my own sake. To Dazzle. I say, old fellow, 
staggering. Just hold the door steady while I go in. This way. Now then, take care. Helps him into the room, right. Enter Sir Hartcourt Courtly, left, in an elegant dressing gown and Greek skullcap and tassels, etc. Sir Harcourt, center. Cool. Is breakfast ready? Cool. Right. Quite ready, Sir Harcourt. Apropos, I omitted to mention that I expect Squire Harkaway to join us this morning, and you must prepare for my departure to Oak Hall immediately. Leave town in the middle of the season, Sir Harcourt. So unprecedented a proceeding. It is. I confess it. There is but one power that could effect such a miracle. That is divinity. How? In female form, of course. Cool. I'm about to present society with a second Lady Courtly. Young, blushing, eighteen, lovely. I have a portrait. Rich. I have a banker's account, an heiress, and a Venus. Lady Courtly could be none other. Ha <laughs> ha, cool. Your manners are above your station. Apropos, I shall find no further use for my brocade dressing gown. I thank you, Sir Harcourt. Might I ask who the fortunate lady is? Uh, certainly, Miss Grace Harkaway, the niece of my old friend, Max. Have you never seen the lady, sir? Never. That is, yes. Eight years ago, having been, as you know, on the continent for the last seven years, I have not had the opportunity of paying my devoirs. Our connection and betrothal was a very extraordinary one. Her father's estates were contiguous to mine, being a penurious, miserly, ugly old scoundrel. He made a market of my indiscretion and, and supplied my extravagance with large sums of money on mortgages, his great desire being to unite the two properties. About seven years ago he died, leaving Grace, a girl, to the guardianship of her uncle, with this will. If, on attaining the age of nineteen, she would consent to marry me, I should receive those deeds and all his property as her dowry. If she refused to comply with this condition, they should revert to my heir, presumptive or apparent. She consents. Cool aside. Who would not? I consent to receive her fifteen thousand pounds a year. Crosses to left. Who would not? So, prepare, Cool, prepare. Crosses to right. Uh, but where is my boy? Where is Charles? Why, oh, he has gone out, Sir Harcourt. Y yes, gone out to take a walk. Poor child. A perfect child in heart, a sober, placid mind, the simplicity and verdure of boyhood, kept fresh and unsullied by any contact with society. Uh, tell me, Cool, at what time was he in bed last night? A half past nine, Sir Harcourt. Half past nine? Beautiful. What an original idea. Reposing in cherub slumber while all around him teems with drinking and debauchery. Primitive sweetness of nature. No pilot-coated, bare-skinned brawling. Oh, Sir Harcourt. No cigar smoking. Faints at the smell of one. No brandy and water bibing. Doesn't know the taste of anything stronger than barley water. No night parading. Never heard the clock strike twelve except at noon. In fact, he is my son, and became a gentleman by right of paternity. He inherited my manners. Enter Martin, left. Mr. Harkaway. Enter Max Harkaway, left. Squire Harkaway, fellow. Or Max Harkaway another time. Martin bows and exit left. Ha <laughs> ha Sir Harcourt, I'm devilishly glad to see you. Give me your fist. Dang it, but I'm glad to see you. Let me see. Six, seven years or more since we have met. How quickly they have flown. Throwing off his studied manner. Max, Max, give me your hand, old boy. Aside. Ah, he is glad to see me. There is no fawning pretense about that squeeze. Cool, you may retire. Exit cool, right. Why, you are looking quite rosy. Aha, rosy. 
Am I too florid? Not a bit. Not a bit. I thought so. Aside. Cool said I'd put too much on. Max left. How comes it, Courtly? You managed to retain your youth. See, I'm as gray as an old badger or a wild rabbit, while you are. You are as black as a young rook. I say, whose head grew your hair, eh? Permit me to remark that all the beauties of my person are of home manufacture. Why should you be surprised at my youth? I have scarcely thrown off the giddiness of a very boy. Elasticity of limb, buoyancy of soul. Remark this position. Throws himself into an attitude. I held that attitude for ten minutes at Lady Acid's last reunion, at the express desire of one of our first sculptors, while he was making a sketch of me for the Apollo. Max, aside. Making a butt of thee for their jibes. Lady Sarah Sarcasm started up and, pointing at my face, ejaculated, Good gracious! Does not Sir Harcourt remind you of the countenance of Ajax in the Pompeian portrait? Ajax? Humbug. You are complimentary. I'm a plain man and always speak my mind. What's in a face or figure? Does a Grecian nose entail a good temper? Does a wasp's waist indicate a good heart? Or do oily perfumed locks necessarily thatch a well-furnished brain? It's an undeniable fact. Plain people always praise the beauties of the mind. Excuse the insinuation. I had thought the first lady courtly had suffered you with beauty. No, she lived fourteen months with me, and then eloped with an intimate friend. Etiquette compelled me to challenge the seducer, so I received satisfaction and a bullet in my shoulder at the same time. However, I had the consolation of knowing that he was the handsomest man of the age. She did not insult me by running away with a damned ill-looking scoundrel. That certainly was flattering. I felt so, as I pocketed the ten thousand pounds damages. That must have been a great balm to your sore honour. It was. Max, my honour, would have died without it. For on that year the wrong horse won the derby, by some mistake. It was one of the luckiest chances, a thing that does not happen twice in a man's life, the opportunity of getting rid of his wife and his debts at the same time. Tell the truth, Courtly. Did you not feel a little frayed in your delicacy? Your honour now, eh? Not a whit. Why should I? I married money, and I received it. Virgin gold. My delicacy and honour had nothing to do with it. The world pities the bereaved husband when it should congratulate. No, the affair made a sensation, and I was the object. Besides, it is vulgar to make a parade of one's feelings, however acute. They may be. Impenetrability of the continents is the sure sign of your high-bred man of fashion. So a man must, therefore, lose his wife and his money with a smile. In fact, everything he possesses but his temper. Exactly, and great ruin with vive la bagatelle. For example, your modish beauty never discomposes the shape of her features with convulsive laughter. A smile rewards the bon mot, and also shows the whiteness of her teeth. She never weeps impromptu. Tears might destroy the economy of her cheek. Scenes are vulgar, hysterics obsolete. She exhibits a calm, placid, impenetrable lake, whose surface is reflection, but of unfathomable depth. A statue whose life is hypothetical, and not a prima facie fact. Crosses to left. Well, give me the girl that will fly at your eyes in an argument and stick to her point like a fox to his own tail. But etiquette, Max. Remember etiquette. Damn etiquette. I have seen a man who thought it sacrilege to eat fish with a knife that would not scruple to raise up and rob his brother of his birthright in a gambling house. Your thoroughbred, well-blooded heart will seldom kick over the traces of good feeling. That's my opinion, and I don't care who knows it. Pardon me. As good as the pulse of society, 
by regulating which the body politic is retained in health. I consider myself one of the faculty of the art. Well, well, you are a living libel upon common sense, for you are old enough to know better. Old enough? What do you mean, old? I still retain all my little juvenile indiscretions, which your niece's beauty must teach me to discard. I have not so my wild oats yet. Time you did at sixty-three. Sixty-three? Good heavens, forty. Upon my life, forty next March. Why, you are older than I am. Oh, you are old enough to be my father. Well, if I am... I am. That's etiquette, I suppose. Poor Grace, how often have I pitied her fate, that a young and beautiful creature should be driven into wretched splendor or miserable poverty. Wretched? Wherefore? Lady Courtly, wretched? Impossible. Will she not be compelled to marry you, whether she likes you or not? A choice between you and poverty. Aside. And hang me if it isn't a tie. But why do you not introduce your son Charles to me? I have not seen him since he was a child. You would never permit him to accept any of my invitations to spend his vacation at Oak Hall. Of course, we shall have the pleasure of his company now. He is not fit to enter society yet. He is a studious, sober boy. Boy? Why, he's five and twenty. Good gracious. Max... You will permit me to know my own son's age. He is not twenty. Oh, I'm dumb. You will excuse me while I indulge in the process of dressing. Cool. Enter cool, right. Uh, prepare my toilet. Exit cool, center. There is a ceremony which, with me, supersedes all others. I consider it a duty which every gentleman owes to society to render himself as agreeable an object as possible. And the least compliment a mortal can pay to nature, when she honours him by bestowing extra care in the manufacture of his person, is to display her taste to the best possible advantage. And so, au revoir. Exit left. Max sits right of table. That's a good soul. He has his faults, and who has not? Forty years of age. Oh, monstrous. But he does look uncommonly young for sixty, spite of his foreign locks and complexions. Enter Dazzle, right. Who is my friend with the stick and gaiters, I wonder? One of the family? The governor? Maybe? Max, right center. Who's this? Ah, oh, Charles. Is that you, my boy? How are you? Aside. This is the boy. He knows me. He's too respectable for a bailiff. Aloud. How are you? Your father has just left me. Dazzle, aside. The devil he has. He has been dead these ten years. Oh, I see. He thinks I'm young courtly. Aloud. The honour you would confer upon me, I must unwillingly disclaim. I am not Mr. Courtly. I beg pardon. A friend, I suppose? Oh, a most intimate friend. A friend of years distantly related to the family one of my ancestors married one of his aside adam and eve are you on a visit here yes oh yes aside rather a short one i'm afraid max aside this appears a dashing kind of fellow as he is a friend of sir harcourt's i'll invite him to the wedding aloud sir if you are not otherwise engaged, I shall feel honoured by your company at my house, Oak Hall, Gloucestershire. Your name is? Harkaway. Max Harkaway. Harkaway. Let me see. I ought to be related to the Harkaways somehow. A wedding is about to come off. Will you take a part on the occasion? With pleasure. Any part but that of the husband. Have you any previous engagement? I was thinking, eh, hey, why, let me see. Aside. Promise to meet my tailor and his account tomorrow. However, I'll postpone that. Aloud. Have you good shooting? Shooting? Why, there is no shooting at this time of year. Oh, I'm in no hurry. 
I can wait till the season, of course. I was only speaking precautionally. You have good shooting? The best in the country. Make yourself comfortable. Say no more. I'm your man. Wait till you see how I'll murder your preserves. Do you hunt? Pardon me, but will you repeat that? Aside. Delicious and expensive idea. You ride? Anything, everything. From a blood to a broomstick. Only catch me a flash of lightning and let me get on the back of it. And dammy if I wouldn't astonish the elements. <laughs> I'll put a girdle round about the earth in very considerably less than forty minutes. <laughs> we'll show all fiddlesticks how to spend the day. He imagines that nature, at the earnest request of fashion, made summer days long for him to saunter in the park, and winter nights that he might have a good time to get cleared out at hazard or at whist. Give me the yelping of a pack of hounds before the shuffling of a pack of cards. What state can match the chase in full cry, each vying with his fellows which shall be most happy? A thousand deaths fly by unheeded in that one hour's life of ecstasy. Time is outrun, and nature seems to grudge our bliss by making the days so short. No, for then rises up the idol of my great adoration. Who's that? The bottle that lends a luster to the soul when the world puts on its nightcap and extinguishes the sun. Then comes the bottle. O oh, mighty wine! Don't ask me to apostrophize. Wine and love are the only two indescribable things in nature. But I prefer the wine because its consequences are not entailed and are more easily got rid of. How so? Love ends in matrimony, wine in soda water. Well, I can promise you as fine a bottle as ever was cracked. Never mind the bottle, give me the wine. Say no more, but when I arrive, just shake one of my hands and put the key of the cellar into the other, and if I don't make myself intimately acquainted with its internal organization, well, I say nothing, time will show. I foresee some happy days. And I some glorious nights. It mustn't be a flying visit. I despise the word. I'll stop a month with you. Or a year or two. I'll live and die with you. <laughs> remember, Max Harkaway, Oak Hall, Gloucestershire. I'll remember. Fare ye well. Max is going. Say halloa. Tally ho. Oh, oh, oh. Yikes! Tally ho! Exit left. There I am, quartered for a couple of years at the least. The old boy wants somebody to ride his horses, shoot his game, and keep a restraint on the morals of the parish. I'm eligible. What a lucky accident to meet young Courtley last night. Who could have thought it? Yesterday I could not make certain of a dinner, except at my own peril. Today I would flirt with a banquet. Enter young Courtley, right. What infernal row was that? Why? Seeing Dazzle. Are you still here? Yes. Ain't you delighted? I'll ring and send the servant for my luggage. The devil you will. Why don't you mean to say you seriously intend to take up a permanent residence here? Rings the bell. Now that's a most inhospitable insinuation. Might I ask your name? With a deal of pleasure. Richard Dazzle, late of unattached volunteers, volgularly entitled The Dirty Buffs. Enter Martin, left. Then, Mr. Richard Dazzle, I have the honour of wishing you a very good morning. Martin, show this gentleman the door. If he does, I'll kick Martin out of it. No offence. Exit Martin, left. Now, sir, permit me to place a dioramic view of your conduct before you. After bringing you safely home this morning... After indulgently waiting, whenever you took a passing fancy to a knocker or bell pull, after conducting a retreat that would have reflected honour on Napoleon, you would kick me into the street like a mangy cur. And that's what you call gratitude? Now, to show you how superior I am to petty malice, I give you an unlimited invitation to my house, my country house, to remain as long as you please. 
Your house? Oak oh, Hall, Gloucestershire. Fine old place. For further particulars, see road book. That is, it nominally belongs to my old friend and relation, Max Harkaway, but I'm privileged. Capital old fellow. Say, shall we be honoured? Sir, permit to hesitate a moment. Aside. Let me see. I go back to college tomorrow, so I shall not be missing. Tradesmen begin to dun... A noise off left, between Martin and Isaacs. Cool has entered centre, crosses and goes off left. I hear thunder. Here is shelter ready for me. Re-enter Cool left. Oh, uh, Mr. Charles, Mr. Solomon Isaacs is in the hall, and swears he will remain till he has arrested you. Does he? Sorry you're so obstinate. Taking my compliments, I will bet him five to one he will not. Double or quits, with my kind regards. But, sir, he has discovered the house in Curzon Street. He says he is aware the furniture at least belongs to you, and he will put a man in immediately. That's awkward. What's to be done? Ask him whether he couldn't make it a woman. I must trust that to fate. I will give you my acceptance. If it will be of any use to you, it is of none to me. No, sir, but in reply to your most generous and kind invitation, if you be in earnest, I shall feel delighted to accept it. Certainly. Then off we go, through the stables, down the mews, and so slip through my friend's fingers. But stay, you must do the polite. Say farewell to him before you part. Damn it, don't cut him. You jest. Here, lend me a card. Courtly gives him one. Now then. Writes. Our respects to Mr. Isaacs. Sorry to have been prevented from seeing him. Ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. We'll send him up some game. Young Courtly, to cool. Don't let my father see him. Excellent. Young Courtly and Dazzle write. Oh, what's this? Mr. Charles Courtly, PPC, returns thanks for obliging inquiries. Exit left. Curtain. End of Act One. Act Two. Scene. The lawn before Oak Hall, a fine Elizabethan mansion. A drawing room is seen through large French windows at the back. Statues, urns, and garden chairs about the stage. Enter Pert, through window left, to James, who is discovered. James, Miss Grace desires me to request that you will watch at the avenue, and let her know when the squire's carriage is seen on the London road. Exit. Left. I will go to the lodge. How I do long to see what kind of a man Sir Harcourt Courtly is. They say he is sixty, so he must be old, and consequently ugly. If I were Miss Grace, I would rather give up all my fortune and marry the man I liked than go to church with a stuffed eel skin. But taste is everything. She doesn't seem to care whether he is sixty or sixteen. Jokes at love, prepares for matrimony as she would for dinner, says it is a necessary evil, and what can't be cured must be endured. Now, I say this is against all nature, and she is either no woman, or a deeper one than I am, if she prefers an old man to a young one. Here she comes, looking as cheerfully as if she was going to marry Mr. Jenks. My Mr. Jenks, whom nobody won't lead to the halter till I have that honor. Enter Grace, from the drawing room, left. Well, Pert, any signs of my uncle yet? Pert, left. No, Miss Grace, but James has gone to watch the road. In my uncle's letter, he mentions a Mr. Dazzle, whom he has invited. So you must prepare a room for him. He is some friend of my husband that is to be, and my uncle seems to have taken an extraordinary predilection for him. Apropos, I must not forget to have a bouquet for the dear old man when he arrives. The dear old man? Do you mean Sir Harcourt? La, no. My uncle, of course. Plucking flowers? What do I care for Sir Harcourt Courtly? Cross is right. Isn't it odd, miss, you've never seen your intended, though it has been so long since you were betrothed? Not at all. Marriage matters are conducted nowadays in a most mercantile manner. Consequently, a previous acquaintance is by no means indispensable. Besides, my prescribed husband has been upon the continent for the benefit of his property. They say a southern climate is a great restorer of consumptive estates. Well, miss, for my own part, I should like to have a good look at my bargain before I paid for it, especially when one's life is the price of the article. But why, ma'am, do you consent to marry in this blind man's buff sort of manner? What would
would you think if he were not quite so old i should think he was a little younger i should like him all the better that wouldn't i a young husband might expect affection and nonsense which twould be deceit in me to render nor would he permit me to remain with my uncle sir harcourt takes me with the encumbrances on his estate and i shall beg to be left among the rest of the livestock crosses left ah miss but some day you might chance to stumble over the man what could you do then do beg the man's pardon and request the man to pick me up again ah you were never in love miss i never was nor will be till i'm tired of myself and common sense love is a pleasant scapegoat for a little epidemic madness i must have been inoculated in my infancy for the infection passes over poor me in contempt enter james left two gentlemen miss grace have just alighted very well james exit james left love is pictured as a boy in another century they will be wiser and paint him as a fool with cap and bells without a thought above the jingling of his own folly now pert remember this as a maxim a woman is always in love with one of two things what are they miss a man or herself and i know which is the most profitable exit left i wonder what my jenks would say if i was to ask him la here comes mr metal his rival contemporary solicitor as he calls him nasty prying ugly wretch what brings him up here he comes puffed with some news retires up right enter metal with a newspaper left i have secured the only newspaper in the village my character as an attorney at law depended on the monopoly of its information i took it up by chance when this paragraph met my astonished view reads we understand that the contract of marriage so long in abeyance on account of the lady's minority is about to be celebrated at oak hall gloucestershire the well-known and magnificent mansion of maximilian harkaway esq between sir harcourt courtly baronet of fashionable celebrity and miss grace harkaway niece to the said mr harkaway the preparations are proceeding in the good old english style is it possible i seldom swear except in a witness box but damn had it been known in the village my reputation would have been lost my voice in the parlor of the red lion mute and jenks a fellow who calls himself a lawyer without more capability than a broomstick and as much impudence as a young barrister after getting a verdict by mistake why he would actually have taken the reverend mr spout by the button which is now my sole privilege sees pert ah here is mrs pert couldn't have hit upon a better person i'll cross-examine her lady's maid to miss grace confidential purloiner of second-hand silk a niecy prius of her mistress ah uh, sits on the woolsack in the pantry and dictates the laws of kitchen etiquette pert comes forward ah mrs pert good morning permit me to say and my word as a legal character is not unduly considered i venture to affirm that you look uh, quite like the uh pert left law mr metal metal right exactly like the law ha indeed complimentary i must confess like the law tedious prosy made up of musty paper you shan't have a long suit of me good morning going stay mrs pert don't calumniate my calling or disseminate vulgar prejudices vulgar you talk of vulgarity to me you whose sole employment is to sneak about like a pig snouting out of the dust-hole of society and feeding upon the bad ends of vice you who live upon the world's iniquity you miserable specimen of a bad six and eight pence following him around to right metal right but mrs pert pert right center don't butt me sir i won't be butted by any such low fellow this is slander an action will lie let it lie lying is your trade i'll tell you what mr metal if i had my will i would soon put a check on your prying propensities i'd treat you as the farmers do inquisitive hogs how i would wring your nose exit into house left not much information elicited from that witness jenks is at the bottom of this 
I have very little hesitation in saying Jenks is a libelous rascal. I heard reports that he was undermining my character here through Mrs. Pert. Now I'm certain of it. Assault is expensive, but I certainly will put by a small weekly stipendium until I can afford to kick Jenks. Dazzle, outside. Come along, this way. Ah, whom have we here? Visitors. I'll address them. Enter Dazzle, left. Who is this, I wonder? One of the family? I must know him. To meddle. Ah, how are ye? Quite well. Just arrived? Uh, um... Might I request the honour of knowing whom I address? Richard Dazzle, Esquire. And you? Mark Meddle, attorney at law. Enter young Courtly, left. What detained you? My dear fellow, I have just seen such a woman. Dazzle, aside. Hush! Aloud. Permit me to introduce you to my very old friend, Medal. He's a capital fellow. Know him. Medal, right. I feel honoured. Who is your friend? Oh, he? What, my friend? Oh, Augustus Hamilton. How do you do? Looking off. There she is again. Medal, looking off. Why, that is Miss Grace. Dazzle, left centre. Of course, Grace. Young Courtly, centre. I'll go and introduce myself. Dazzle stops him. Dazzle, aside. What are you about? Would you insult my old friend Puddle by running away? Aloud. I say, Puddle, just show my friend the lions, while I say how do you do to my young friend Grace. Aside. Cultivate his acquaintance. Exit. Left upper entrance. Young Courtly looks after him. Mr. Hamilton, might I take the liberty? Young Courtly, looking off. Confound the fellow. Sir, what did you remark? She's gone. Oh, are you still here, Mr. Thing of a Merry Puddle? Meddle, sir. Meddle in the list of attorneys. Well, Muddle or Puddle or whoever you are, you are a bore. Meddle, aside. How excessively odd. Mrs. Pert said I was a pig, now I'm a bore. I wonder what they'll make of me next. Mr. Thingamy, will you take a word of advice? Feel honoured. Get out. Do you mean to... I don't understand. Delighted to quicken your apprehension. You are an ass, Puddle. Ha! Ha 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 ha! Another quadruped. Yes, beautiful. Aside. I wish he'd call me something libelous, but that would be too much to expect. Aloud. Anything else? Some miserable, pettifrogging scoundrel. Good. <laughs> what do you mean by laughing at me? <laughs> Excellent. Delicious. Mr. Are you ambitious of a kicking? Very. Very. Go on. Kick. Go on. Young Courtly, looking off. Here she comes. I'll speak to her. But, sir, sir. Oh, go to the devil. Runs off, left upper entrance. There's a chance lost, gone. I have no hesitation in saying that. In another minute, I should have been kicked. Literally kicked. A legal luxury. Costs, damages, and actions rose up like skyrockets in my aspiring soul, with golden tails reaching to the infinity of my hopes. Looking. They are coming this way. Mr. Hamilton in close conversation with Lady Courtley that is to be. Crim Con, Courtley versus Hamilton. Damages, problematical. Medal, chief witness for plaintiff. Guinea a day, professional man. I'll take down their conversation verbatim. Retires behind a bush, right. Enter Grace, followed by young Courtly. Left upper entrance, Grace, right. Perhaps you would follow your friend into the dining room. Refreshment after your long journey must be requisite. Young Courtly, left. Pardon me, madam, but the lovely garden and the loveliness before me is better refreshment than I could procure in any dining room. Ha! Huh. Your company and compliments arrive together. I trust that a passing remark will not spoil so welcome an introduction as this by offending you. I am not certain that anything you could say would offend me. I never meant... I thought not. In turn, pardon me when I request you will commence your visit with this piece of information. I consider compliments impertinent and sweetmeat language fulsome. I would condemn my tongue to a Pythagorean silence if I thought it could attempt to flatter. It strikes me, sir, that you are a stray bee from the hive of fashion. If so, reserve your honey for its proper cell. 
A truce to compliments. You have just arrived from town, I apprehend. The moment I left mighty London under the fever of a full season, groaning with a noisy pulse of wealth and the giddy whirling brain of fashion, and chanting, Busy London, how have I prevailed on myself to desert you? Next week the new ballet comes out. The week after comes Ascot. Ho! Oh. How agonizing must be the reflection. Torture! Can you inform me how you manage to avoid suicide here? If there was but an opera, even within twenty miles. We couldn't get up a rustic ballet among the village girls, no, huh? I am afraid you would find that difficult. How I contrive to support life, I don't know. It is wonderful, but I have not precisely contemplated suicide yet, nor do I miss the opera. How can you manage to kill time? I can't. Men talk of killing time while time quietly kills them. I have many employments. This week I devote to study and various amusements, next week to being married, the following week to repentance, perhaps. Married? You seem surprised. I believe it is of frequent occurrence in the metropolis, is it not? Oh, yes, I believe they do that there. Might I ask to whom? I have never seen him yet, but he is a gentleman who has been strongly recommended to me for the situation of husband. What an extraordinary match! Would you not consider it advisable to see him, previous to incurring the consequences of such an act? You must be aware that fashion says otherwise. The gentleman swears eternal devotion to the lady's fortune, and the lady swears she will outvie him still. My lord's horses and my lady's diamonds shine through a few seasons, until a seat in Parliament or the Continent stares them in the face. Then, when thrown upon each other for resources of comfort, they begin to quarrel about the original conditions of the sale. Sale? No, that would be degrading civilization into Turkish barbarity. Worse, sir, a great deal worse. For there, at least, they do not attempt concealment of the barter. But here, every London ballroom is a marriage mart. Young ladies are trotted out while the mother, father, or chaperone plays auctioneer and knocks them down to the highest bidder. Young men are ticketed up with their fortunes on their backs, and love turned into a dapper showman, descants on the excellent qualities of the material. Oh, that such a custom could have emanated from the healthy soil of an English heart. No, it never did. Like most of our literary dandyisms and dandy literature, it was borrowed from the French. You seem to laugh at love. Love? Why, the very word is a breathing satire upon man's reason— a mania indigenous to humanity, nature's jester who plays off the tricks upon the world and trips up common sense. When I'm in love, I'll write an almanac for very lack of wit, prognosticate the sighing season when to beware of tears, about this time expect matrimony to be prevalent. <laughs> Why should I lay out my life in love's bonds upon the bare security of a man's world? Enter James, left. The squire, madam, has just arrived, and another gentleman with him. Exit James, left. Grace, aside. My intended, I suppose? I perceive you are one of the railers against what is termed the follies of high life. No, not particularly. I depreciate all folly. By what prerogative can the West End Mint issue absurdity, which, if coined in the East, would be voted vulgar? By a sovereign right, because it has fashion's head upon its side. And that stamps it current. Poor fashion, for how many sins hast thou to answer? The gambler pawns his birthright for fashion. The roué steals his friend's wife for fashion. Each abandons himself to the storm of impulse, calling it the breeze of fashion. Is this idol of the world so radically vicious? No, the root is well enough as the body was until it had outgrown its native soil. But now, like a mighty giant lying over Europe, it pillows its head in Italy, its heart in France, leaving the heels alone its sole support for England. Pardon me, madam. You wrong yourself to rail against your own inheritance, the kingdom to which loveliness and wit attest your title. A mighty realm, forsooth, with milliners for ministers, a cabinet of coxcombs, envy for my homage, ruin for my revenue, my right of rule depending on the shape of a bonnet or the set of a police, with the next grand noodle as my heir apparent. Mr. Hamilton, when I am crowned, I shall feel happy to abdicate in your favor. Curtsy and exit into house left. What did she mean by that? Hang me if I can understand her. 
She is evidently not used to society. Ha! Takes every word I say for infallible truth. Requires a solution of a compliment, as if it were a problem in Euclid. She said she was about to marry, but I rather imagined she was in jest. Upon my life, I feel very queer at the contemplation of such an idea. I'll follow her. Metal comes down, left. Oh, perhaps this booby can inform me something about her. Metal makes signs at him. What the devil is he at? It won't do, no, uh, um, it is not to be done. What do you mean? Metal points after Grace. Council retained, cause to come off. Cause to come off? Miss Grace is about to be married. Is it possible? Certainly. If I have the drawing out of the deeds... To whom? Ha, hmm. Oh, yes, I dare say. Information being scarce in the market, I hope to make mine valuable. Married? Married? Pacing the stage. Now I shall have another chance. I'll run and ascertain the truth of this from Dazzle. Exit left. It's of no use. He either dare not kick me or he can't afford it. In either case, he is beneath my notice. Ah, who comes here? Can it be Sir Harcourt Courtly himself? It can be no other. Enter Cool, left. Sir, I have the honor to bid you welcome to Oak Hall and the village of Oldborough. Cool, aside. Excessively polite. Aloud. Sir, thank you. The township contains two thousand inhabitants. Does it? I am delighted to hear it. Crosses right. Medal, aside. I can charge him for that. Ahem, six and eight pence is not much, but it is a beginning. Aloud. If you will permit me, I can inform you of the different commodities for which it is famous. I'm much obliged. But here comes Sir Harcourt Courtley, my master, and Mr. Harkaway. Any other time I shall feel delighted. Oh. Aside. Mistook the man for the master. Retires upright. Enter Max and Sir Harcourt left. Max, center. Here we are at last. Now give ye welcome to Oak Hall, Sir Harcourt, heartily. Sir Harcourt, left center, languidly. Cool, assist me. Cool takes off his cloak and gloves, gives him white gloves and handkerchief, then places a flower in his coat. Why, you require unbacking as carefully as my best bin of port. Well, now you are decanted. Tell me, what did you think of my park as we came along? That it would never come to an end. You said that it was only a stone's throw from your infernal lodge to the house. Why, it's ten miles at least. I'll do it in ten minutes any day. Yes, in a steam carriage. Cool. Perfume my handkerchief. Don't do it. Don't. Perfume in the country. Why, it's high treason in the very face of nature. Tis introducing the robbed to the robber. Here are the sweets from which your fulsome essences are pilfered and libeled with their names. Don't insult them, too. Metal comes down center. Sir Harcourt to Metal. Oh, call me a bouquet, my man. Max, turning. Ah, Metal, how are you? This is Lawyer Metal. Goes up right. Oh, I took him for one of your people. Ah, naturally. Um, Sir Harcourt Courtly, I have the honor to congratulate... Happy occasion approaches. Ahem, I have no hesitation in saying this very happy occasion approaches. Cool. Is the conversation addressed towards me? Cool. Left. I believe so, Sir Harcourt. Medal. Center. Oh, certainly. I was complimenting you. Sir, you are very good. The honor is undeserved, but I am only in the habit of receiving compliments from the fair sex. Men's admiration is so damnably insipid. Crosses to Max, who is seated on bench left. I had hoped to make a unit on that occasion. Yes, and you hoped to put an infernal number of ciphers upon your unit on that and any other occasion. Ha ha ha, very good. Why, I did hope to have the honor of drawing out the deeds, for whatever Jenks may have to say to the contrary, I have no hesitation in saying. Sir Harcourt, putting him aside, to Max... If the future Lady Courtly is visible at so unfashionable an hour as this, I shall beg to be introduced. Visible? Ever since six this morning, I'll warrant ye. Two to one, she is at dinner. Dinner? Is it possible? Lady Courtly dined at half past one p.m.? Medal, down left. I rather prefer that hour to peck a little my 
Dear me, who was addressing you? Oh, I beg pardon? Yeah, James. Calling. Enter James, left. Tell Miss Grace to come here directly. Exit James, into house, left. Now prepare, Courtly, for, though I say it, she is, oh, with the exception of my bay mare, Kitty, the handsomest thing in the country. Considering she is a biped, she is a wonder. Full of blood, sound wind and limb, plenty of bone, sweet coat, in fine condition, with a thoroughbred step as dainty as a pet greyhound. Damn, don't compare her to a horse. Well, I wouldn't, but she's almost as fine a creature. Close similarities. Oh, very fine creature. Close similarity amounting to identity. Good gracious, sir. What can a lawyer know about women? Everything. The consistorial court is a fine study of the character, and I have no hesitation in saying that I have examined more women than Jenks, or... Oh, damn Jenks. Sir, thank you. Damn him again, sir. Damn him again. Enter Grace from house left. Grace runs to him. My dear uncle. Ah, Grace, you little jade. Come here. Sir Harcourt, eyeing her through his glass. Oh, dear. She is a little Venus. I'm astonished and delighted. Won't you kiss your old uncle? Kisses her. Sir Harcourt draws an agonizing face. Oh, uh, um, Limbote. Um, my privilege in embryo. Um, it's very tantalizing, though. You are not glad to see me. You are not. Kissing her again. Oh, no, no. Aside. That is too much. I shall do something horrible presently if this goes on. Aloud. I should be sorry to curtail any little ebullition of affection, but, uh, um, may I be permitted? Of course you may. There, Grace, is Sir Harcourt, your husband that will be. Go to him, girl. She curtsies. Uh, permit me to do homage to the charms, the presence of which have placed me in sight of paradise. Sir Harcourt and Grace retire. Enter Dazzle, left. Ah, old fellow, how are you? Crosses to Max. Max, right center. I'm glad to see you. Are you comfortably quartered yet, eh? Splendidly quartered. What a place you've got here. Here's Hamilton. Enter young Courtly from house downright. Permit me to introduce my friend, Augustus Hamilton. Capital fellow. Drinks like a sieve and rides like a thunderstorm. Max, right center. Sir, I'm devilishly glad to see you. Here, Sir Harcourt. Permit me to introduce you to... Goes up to Sir Harcourt. The devil. Dazzle, right center, aside. What's the matter? Young Courtly, aside. Why, that is my governor by Jupiter. Dazzle, aside. What? Old Whiskers? You didn't say that. Young Courtly, aside. It is. What's to be done now? Max, advancing, center. A Mr. Hamilton? Sir Harcourt Courtly. Sir Harcourt Courtly? A Mr. Hamilton. Sir Harcourt, advancing, left center. Hamilton? Good gracious. Bless me. Why, Charles, is it possible? Why, Max, that's my son. Young Courtly, aside. What shall I do? Your son? Your son, Sir Harcourt. Have you a son as old as that gentleman? No, that is, uh, yes, not by twenty years. Uh, Charles, uh, why don't you answer me, sir? Young Courtly, aside to Dazzle. What shall I say? Dazzle, aside. Deny your identity. Young Courtly, aside. Capital. Allowed. What's the matter, sir? How came you down here, sir? By one of Newman's best fours in twelve hours and a quarter. I isn't your name Charles Courtley? Not to my knowledge. Do you mean to say that you're usually called Augustus Hamilton? Mm, lamentable fact, and quite correct. Cool. Is that my son? Cool. Left. No, sir. It is not Mr. Charles, but it is very like him. I cannot understand all this. Goes up. Grace. Aside. I think I can. Goes up. Dazzle. Aside to young Courtly. Give him a touch of the indignant. Young Courtly crosses right center. Allow me to say, sir, what do you call your Hartley? Hartley, sir. Courtly, sir. Courtly. Well, Hartley or Courtheart or whatever your name may be, 
I say your conduct is, uh, uh, were it not for the presence of a lady, I should feel inclined to, to... No, no, that can't be my son. He never would address me in that way. Max, coming down. What is all this? Uh, sir, your likeness to my son Charles is so astonishing that, uh, for a moment, the equilibrium of my etiquette, upon my life, I... Uh, permit me to request your pardon. Medal, left. Sir Harcourt, don't apologize, don't. Bring an action. I'm witness. Uh, someone take this man away. Metal goes upstage with Cool. Enter James from house left. Luncheon is on the table, sir. Miss Harcourt, I never swore before a lady in my life, except when I promised to love and cherish the late Lady Courtly, which I took care to preface with an apology. I was compelled to the ceremony and consequently not answerable for the language. But to that gentleman's identity, I would have pledged my hair. Grace aside. If that security were called for, I suspect the answer would be no effects. Excellent. Sir Harcourt and Grace left. Medal to Max. I have something very particular to communicate. Can't listen at present. Exit left into house. Medal to Dazzle and Young Courtly. I can afford you information which I... Go to the... Oh, do don't bother. Excellent. Left into house. Now, I have no hesitation in saying that is the height of ingratitude. Oh, Mr. Cool, can you oblige me? Presents his account. Cool, right. Why, what is all this? Small account versus you. To giving information concerning the last census of the population of Oldborough and vicinity. Six and eight pence. Oh, you mean to make me pay for this, do you? Unconditionally. Well, I have no objection. The charge is fair. But remember, I am a servant on board wages. Will you throw in a little advice, gratis, if I give you the money? Ahem, I will. A fellow has insulted me. I want to abuse him. What terms are actionable? You may call him anything you please, providing there are no witnesses. Oh, may I? Looks around. Then you rascally, pettifogging scoundrel. Hello. Retreats to right. Cool, following him. You mean dirty disgrace to your profession. Libel. Slander. Cool, going up left, turns. Aye, but where are your witnesses? Give me the costs. Six and eight pence. I deny that you gave me the information at all. You do? Yes. Where are your witnesses? Exit into house left. Ah, damn, I'm done at last. Exit into house left. Curtain. End of Act Two. Act Four. Scene. Same as Act Three. Grace and Lady Gay discovered drinking coffee. Grace on Ottoman Center. If there be one habit more abominable than another, it is that of the gentlemen sitting over their wine. It is a selfish, unfeeling fashion, and a gross insult to our sex. Lady Gay, right. We are turned out just when the fun begins. How happy the poor wretches look at the contemplation of being rid of us. The conventional signal for the ladies to withdraw is anxiously and deliberately waited for. Then I begin to wish I were a man. The instant the door is closed upon us, there rises a roar. In celebration of their short-lived liberty, my love, rejoicing over their emancipation. I think it very insulting, whatever it may be. Ah, oh, my dear, philosophers say that man is the creature of an hour. It is the dinner hour, I suppose. Dazzle without... A song! A song! Voices as if in approval of the proposition, knocking on table, etc. Bravo at back. Enter servant left to take coffee cups from Lady Gay and Grace. I am afraid they are getting too pleasant to be agreeable. I hope the squire will restrict himself. After his third bottle, he becomes rather voluminous. Cries of silence. Someone is going to sing. Jumps up. Let us hear. Spanker is heard to sing. A southerly wind in a cloudy sky. After verse, chorus. Oh, no, Gay, for heaven's sake. Oh, ho! <laughs> 
Why, that is my dolly! At the conclusion of the verse, Well, I never heard my dolly sing before! Happy wretches, how I envy them! Enter James, left with a note. Mr. Hamilton has just left the house for London. Impossible! That is without seeing... That is... <laughs> he never... Speak, sir. He left Miss Grace in a desperate hurry, and this note, I believe, for you. Presenting a note on Solver. For me. About to snatch it, but restraining herself, takes it coolly. Exit James, left. Excuse me, Gay. Reads. Your manner during dinner has left me no alternative but instant departure. My absence will release you from the oppression which my society must necessarily inflict on your sensitive mind. It may tend also to smother, though it can never extinguish, that indomitable passion of which I am the passive victim. Dare I supplicate pardon and oblivion for the past? It is the last request of the self-deceived, but still loving, Augustus Hamilton. Puts her hand to her forehead and appears giddy. Hello, Grace. Pull up. What's the matter? Grace, recovering herself. Nothing. The heat of the room. Oh? What excuse does he make? Particular unforeseen business, I suppose? Why, yes, a mere formula. Uh, uh, you may put it in the fire. Puts it in her bosom. Lady Gay, aside. It is near enough to the fire where it is. Grace, center. I'm glad he's gone. Lady Gay, right. So am I. He was a disagreeable, ignorant person. Yes, and so vulgar. No, he was not at all vulgar. I mean, in appearance. Oh, how can you say so? He was very distingué. Well, I might have been mistaken, but I took him for a forward intrusive. Good gracious, Gay. He was very retiring, even shy. Lady Gay aside. It's all right. She is in love. Blows hot and cold in the same breath. How can you be a competent judge? Why, you have not known him more than a few hours, while I, I have known him for two days and a quarter. I yield, I confess, I never was or will be so intimate with him as you appear to be. <laughs> Loud noise of argument. The folding doors are thrown open. Enter the whole party of gentlemen, apparently engaged in warm discussion. They assemble in knots while the servants hand coffee, etc. Max, Sir Harcourt, Dazzle, and Spanker together. Dazzle, left. But, my dear sir, consider the state of the two countries under such a constitution. Sir Harcourt, left center. The two countries, what have they to do with the subject? Max, left center. Everything. Look at their two legislative bodies. Spanker, center. Aye. Look at their two legislative bodies. Why, it would inevitably establish universal anarchy and confusion. Grace, right center. I think they are pretty well established already. Well, suppose it did. What has anarchy and confusion to do with the subject? Lady Gay, right center. Do look at my dolly. He is arguing. Talking politics. Upon my life, he is. Calling. Mr. Spanker, my dear. Excuse me, love. I am discussing a point of importance. Oh, that is delicious. He must discuss that to me. She goes up and leads him down. He appears to have shaken off his gaucherie. She shakes her head. Dolly, Dolly. Pardon me, Lady Gay Spanker. I conceive your mutilation of my sponsorial appellation highly derogatory to my amour prop. Your what? Ho ho! 
and i particularly request that for the future i may not be treated with that cavalier spirit which does not become your sex nor your station your ladyship you have been indulging till you have lost the little wit nature dribbled into your unfortunate little head your brains want the whipper in you are not yourself madam i am doubly myself and permit me to inform you that unless you voluntarily pay obedience to my commands i shall enforce them your commands yes madam i mean to put a full stop to your hunting you do ah aside i can scarcely speak from delight aloud who put such an idea into your head for i am sure it is not an original emanation of your genius sir harcourt courtly my friend and now mark me i request for your own sake that i may not be compelled to assert my uh, my authority as your husband i shall say no more than this if you persist in your absurd rebellion well contemplate a separation looks at her haughtily and retires center now i'm happy my own little darling inestimable dolly has tumbled into a spirit somehow sir harcourt too <laughs> he's trying to make him ill-treat me so that his own suit may thrive sir harcourt left advances lady gay lady gay aside now for it they sit on ottoman center what hours of misery were those i passed when by your secession the room suffered a total eclipse ah you flatter no pardon me that would be impossible no believe me i tried to join in the boisterous mirth but my thoughts would desert to the drawing-room ah how i envied the careless levity and cool indifference with which mr spunker enjoyed your absence dazzle who is lounging in a chair right max that madeira is worth its weight in gold i hope you have more of it max right talking with grace and spanker a pipe i think i consider a magnum of that nectar and a meerschaum of canister to consummate the ultimatum of all mundane bliss to drown myself in liquid ecstasy and then blow a cloud on which the enfranchised soul could soar above olympus oh enter james left mr charles courtley exit left ah oh, now max you must see a living apology for my conduct enter young courtley dressed very plainly left well charles how are you don't be afraid there max what do you say now max right center well this is the most extraordinary likeness grace right aside yes considering it is the original i am not so easily deceived max crosses left center and shakes hands sir i am delighted to see you thank you sir dazzle right will you be kind enough to introduce me sir harcourt this is mr dazzle charles which looking from spanker right center to dazzle right dazzle crosses right center nearly tumbling over spanker who goes up charles winks at dazzle sir harcourt to lady gay is not that refreshing miss harkaway charles this is your mother or rather will be madam i shall love honour and obey you punctually takes out a book sighs and goes up reading enter james left you perceive quite unused to society perfectly ignorant of every conventional rule of life the doctor 
and the young ladies have arrived. Exit. Left. The young ladies? Now we must go to the hall. I make it a rule always to commence the festivities with a good old country dance. A rattling Sir Roger de Coverley. Come, Sir Harcourt. Does this antiquity require a war whoop in it? Max, center. Nothing but a nimble foot and a light heart. Very antediluvian indispensables. Lady Gay Spunk, will you honor me by becoming my preceptor? Why, I am engaged, but... Aloud. On such a plea as Sir Harcourt's, I must waive all obstacles. Gives her hand. Now, Grace, girl, give your hand to Mr. Courtley. Grace, sitting center. Pray excuse me, uncle. I have a headache. Sir Harcourt, aside, left center, leading Lady Gay. Jealousy, by the gods. Jealous of my devotions to another's fane. Aloud. Charles, my boy, amuse Miss Grace during our absence. Exit with Lady Gay, left. Max, left. But don't you dance, Mr. Courtley? Young Courtley, right. Dance, sir? I never dance. I can procure exercise in a much more rational manner, and music disturbs my meditations. Well, do the gallant. Exit left with Spanker and Dazzle. I never studied that art, but I have a prize essay on a hydrostatic subject which would delight her, for it enchanted the Reverend Dr. Pump of Corpus Christi. Grace, aside. What on earth could have induced him to disfigure himself in that frightful way? I rather suspect some plot to entrap me into a confession. Young Courtly, aside. Dare I confess this trick to her? No, not until I have proved her affection indisputably. Let me see. I must concoct. Takes a chair and, forgetting his assumed character, is about to take his natural free manner. Grace looks surprised. He turns abashed. Madam, I have been desired to amuse you. Thank you. The labor we delight in, physics, pain, I will draw you a moral... Um, uh, subjects, the effects of inebriety, which, according to Ben Johnson, means perplexion of the intellects, caused by imbibing spiritous liquors. About an hour before my arrival, I passed an appalling evidence of the effects of this state. A carriage was overthrown, horses killed, gentlemen in a hopeless state, with his neck broken, all occasioned by the intoxication of the postboy. That is very amusing. I found it edifying, nutritious food for reflection. The expiring man desired his best compliments to you. To me? She rises. Yes. His name was? Mr. Augustus Hamilton. Augustus, oh! Affects to faint, sinking on the ottoman. Young Courtly, aside. Huzzah! She loves me! But where, sir, did this happen? About four miles down the road. He must be conveyed here. Enter James, left. Mr. Meddle, madam. Exit left. Enter Meddle. Left. On very particular business. The very person. My dear sir. Medal. Left. My dear madam. Grace. Center. You must execute a very particular commission for me immediately. Mr. Hamilton has met with a frightful accident on the London road, and he is in a dying state. Well, I have no hesitation in saying he takes it uncommonly easy. He looks as if he was used to it. You mistake. That is not Mr. Hamilton, but Mr. Courtley, who will explain everything and conduct you to the spot. Young Courtley, aside. Oh, I must put a stop to all this, or I should be found out. Aloud. Madam, that were useless, for I omitted to mention a small fact which occurred before I left Mr. Hamilton. He died. Dear me. Oh, we needn't trouble you, Mr. Meadow. Music heard without, left. Hark, I hear they are commencing a waltz. If you will ask me, perhaps a turn or two in the dance may tend to dispel the dreadful sensations you have aroused. Young Courtly, aside. If I can understand her, hang me. Here's of my death screams out, and then asks me to waltz. I am bewildered. Can she suspect me? I wonder what she likes best. Me or my double? Confound this disguise. I must retain it. I have gone too far with my dad to pull up now. Aloud. At your service, madam. He crosses behind to left and offers his hand. Grace, aside. I will pay him well for this trick. Aloud. Ah, poor Augustus Hamilton. Exeunt, left, all but metal. 
Well, if that is not Mr. Hamilton, scratch me out with a big blade, for I am a blot, a mistake upon the rolls. There is an error in the pleadings somewhere, and I will discover it. I would swear to his identity before the most discriminating jury. By the by, this accident will form a capital excuse for my presence here. I just stepped in to see how matters worked, and... Stay, here comes the bridegroom-elect. And, oh, in his very arms, Lady Gay Spanker. Looks round. Where are my witnesses? Oh, that someone were here. However, I can retire and get some information, eh? Spanker versus Courtly. Damages. Witness. Gets into an armchair, which he turns round, back to the audience. Enter Sir Harcourt Courtly, supporting Lady Gay left. This cool room will recover you. Excuse my trusting to you for support. I am transported. Allow me thus ever to support this lovely burden, and I shall conceive that paradise is regained. They sit. Oh, Sir Harcourt, I feel very faint. The waltz made you giddy. And I have left my salts in the other room. I always carry a flask on for the express accommodation of the fair sex. Producing a smelling bottle and sitting right of her. Thank you. Ah. She sighs. What a sigh was there. The vapor of consuming grief. Is it possible? Have you a grief? Are you unhappy? Dear me. Am I not married? What a horrible state of existence. I am never contradicted. So there are none of those enlivening, interesting little differences which so pleasingly diversify the monotony of conjugal life. Like spots of verdure, no quarrels like oases in the desert of matrimony, no rows. How vulgar, what a brute. I never have anything but my own way, and he won't permit me to spend more than I like. Mean-spirited wretch. How can I help being miserable? Miserable? I wonder you are not in a lunatic asylum with such unheard of barbarism. But worse than all that... Can it be out heralded? Yes, I could forgive that. I do. It is my duty. But only imagine, picture to yourself, my dear Sir Harcourt, though I, the third daughter of an earl, married him out of pity for his destitute and helpless situation as a bachelor with ten thousand a year. Conceive, if you can, he actually permits me, with the most placid indifference, to flirt with any old fool I may meet. Good gracious, miserable idiot. I fear there is an incompatibility of temper which renders a separation inevitable. Indispensable, my dear madam. Ah, uh, had I been the happy possessor of such a realm of bliss, what a beatific eternity enfolds itself to my extending imagination. Had another man but looked at you, I should have annihilated him at once, and if he had the temerity to speak, his life alone could have expiated his crime. Oh, an existence of such a nature is too bright for the eye of thought. Too sweet to bear reflection. My devotion. Eternal G. Oh, Sir Harcourt. Sir Harcourt, more fervently. Your every thought should be a separate study, each wish forestalled by the quick apprehension of a kindred soul. Alas, how can I avoid my fate? If a life, a heart, were offered to your 
astonished view by one who is considered the index of fashion, the vein of the beau monde, if you saw him at your feet, begging, beseeching your acceptance of all, and more than this, what would your answer? Ah, I know of none so devoted. You do? Throwing himself upon his knees. Behold, Sir Harcourt, courtly. Metal jumps up into the chair and writes in his memorandum book. Lady Gay, aside. <laughs> Yikes, puss has broken cover. Metal sits again. Speak, adored dearest Lady Gay, speak. Will you fly from the tyranny, the wretched misery of such a monster's roof, and accept the soul that lives but in your presence? Do not press me. Oh, spare a weak, yielding woman. Be contented to know that you are, alas, too dear to me. But the world... The world would say... Let us be a precedent to open a more extended and liberal view of matrimonial advantages to society. How irresistible is your argument. Oh, pause. They put their chairs back. I have ascertained for a fact that every tradesman of mine lives with his wife, and thus you see... It has become a vulgar and plebeian custom. Leave me. I feel I cannot withstand your powers of persuasion. Swear that you will never forsake me. Dictate the oath. May I grow wrinkled. May two inches be added to the circumference of my waist. May I lose the fall in my back. May I be old and ugly the instant I forgo. One tithe of adoration. I must believe you. Shall we leave this detestable spot, this horrible vicinity? The sooner, the better. Tomorrow evening, let it be. Now, let me return. My absence will be remarked. He kisses her hand. Do I appear confused? Has my education rendered me unfit to enter the room? more angelic by a lovely tinge of heightened colour. Tomorrow, in this room, which opens on the lawn. At eleven o'clock? The rest of the family will be at supper. I'll plead in disposition. Have your carriage in waiting and four horses. Remember, please be particular to have four don't let the affair come off shabbily. Adieu, dear Sir Harcourt. Exit. Right. Sir Harcourt marches pompously across the stage. <laughs> Vini, vidi, vici. Hannibal, Caesar, Napoleon, Alexander. Never completed so fair a conquest in so short a time. She dropped fascinated. This is an unprecedented example of the irresistible force of personal appearance combined with polished address. Poor creature, how she loves me. I pity so prostrating a passion and ought to return it. I will. It is a duty I owe to society and fashion. Exit left. Medal turns the chair round. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. This is my tide. I am the only witness. Virtue is sure to find its own reward. But I've no time to contemplate what it shall be. Something huge. Let me see. Spanker versus Courtly. Crim Con. Damages placed at... A hundred and fifty thousand pounds at least, for juries always decimate your hopes. Enter Spanker, left. I cannot find Gay anywhere. The plaintiff himself. I must commence the action. Mr. Spanker, as I have information of deep and vital importance to impart, will you take a seat? They sit solemnly. Metal takes out a notebook and pencil. Ahem. You have a wife? Re-enter Lady Gay, right. 
She crosses behind to left door and listens. Spanker, left center. Yes, I believe I... Metal, right center. Will you be kind enough without any preverification to answer my questions? You have a wife. You, the alarm? I... Compose yourself and reserve your feelings. Take time to consider. You have a wife? Yes. He has a wife. Good. A bona fide wife, bound morally and legally to be your wife, and nobody else's in effect except on your written permission? But what has this... Hush. Allow me, my dear sir, to congratulate you. Shakes his hand. What for? Lady Gay Spanker is about to dishonor the bond of wedlock by eloping from you. Spanker, starting. What? Metal, pushing him down again. I thought you would be overjoyed. Place the affair in my hands and I will venture to promise the largest damages on record. Spanker, starts up. Damn the damages. I want my wife. Oh, I'll go and ask her not to run away. She may run away with me. She may hunt, she may ride, anything she likes. Oh, sir, let's put a stop to this affair. Metal, who has put the chairs back. Put a stop to it. Do not alarm me, sir. Sir, you will spoil the most exquisite brief that was ever penned. It must proceed. It shall proceed. It is illegal to prevent it, and I will bring an action against you for willful intent to injure the profession. Oh, what an ass I am. Oh, I have driven her to this. It was all that cursed brandy punch on top of the burgundy. What a fool I was. It was the happiest moment of your life. So I thought at the time, but we live to grow wiser. Tell me, who is the vile seducer? Sir Harcourt Courtley. Ah, he is my best friend. I should think he is. If you will accompany me, here is a verbatim copy of the whole transaction in shorthand, sworn to by me. Only let me have Gay back again. Even that may be arranged. This way. That ever I should live to see my wife run away. Oh, I will do anything. Keep two packs of hounds. Buy up every horse and ass in England. Myself included. Oh. Exeunt Spanker and Metal, right. <laughs> Poor Dolly. I'm sorry I must continue to deceive him. If he would but kindle up a little. So that fellow overheard all. Well, so much the better. Enter young Courtly, left. My dear madam, how fares the plot? Does my governor nibble? Nibble? He is caught and in the basket. I have just left him with a hook in his gills, panting for the very lack of element. But how goes your encounter? Bravely. By a simple ruse, I have discovered that she loves me. I see but one chance against the best termination I could hope. What is it? My father has told me that I return to town again tomorrow afternoon. Well, I insist you stop and dine. Keep out of the way. Oh, but what excuse shall I offer for disobedience? What can I say when he sees me before dinner? Say, say grace. Enter grace, left, and gets behind the window curtains, right center. Aha! I have arranged to elope with Sir Harcourt myself tomorrow night. The juice you have. Now, if you could persuade Grace to follow that example, his carriage will be in waiting at the park. Be there a little before eleven, and it will just prevent our escape. Can you make her agree to that? Oh, without the slightest difficulty, if Mr. Augustus Hamilton supplicates. Success attend you. Going right. I will bend the haughty grace. Going left. Do. Excellent. Severally. Grace, right center at back. Will you? Quick curtain. End of Act 4. Act 3. Scene. A morning room in Oak Hall. 
French windows opening to the lawn. Max and Sir Harcourt seated on one side, Dazzle on the other. Grace and young Courtley playing chess at back, all dressed for dinner. Max, aside to Sir Harcourt. What can I do? Get rid of them civilly. What? Turn them out after I particularly invited them to stay a month or two? Why, they are disreputable characters. As for that young fellow in whom my lady Courtley appears so particularly absorbed, I am bewildered. I have written to town for my Charles, my boy. It certainly is the most extraordinary likeness. Sir Harcourt, I have an idea. Sir, I am delighted to hear it. Aside to Max. That fellow is a swindler. I met him at your house. Never saw him before in all my life. Dazzle, crossing to Sir Harcourt. I will bet you five to one that I can beat you three out of four games of billiards with one hand. No, sir. I don't mind giving you ten points in fifty. Sir, I never gamble. You don't? Well, I'll teach you. Easiest thing in life. You have every requisite. Good temper. I have not, sir. A long-headed, knowing old buck. Sir. They go up, conversing with Max Center. Really, Mr. Hamilton, you improve. A young man pays us a visit, as you half intimate, to escape inconvenient friends. That is complimentary to us, his hosts. Nay, that is too severe. After an acquaintanceship of two days, you sit down to teach me chess and domestic economy at the same time. Might I ask where you graduated in that science, where you learned all that store of matrimonial advice which you have obliged me with? They come forward. I imbibed it, madam, from the moment I beheld you, and having studied my subject, con amore, took my degree from your eyes. Oh, I see you are a master of arts already. Unfortunately, no. I shall remain a bachelor till you can assist me to that honour. Sir Harcourt rises, dazzle aside right. How do you get on? Young Courtly, aside. Splendidly. Keep the old boy away. Sir Harcourt, going to them. Is the conversation strictly confidential, or might I join? Dazzle, taking his arm. Oh, not in the least, my dear sir. We were remarking that rifle shooting was an excellent diversion during the summer months. Sir Harcourt, drawing himself up. Sir, I was addressing... And I was saying what a pity it was that I couldn't find anyone reasonable enough to back his opinion with long odds. Come out on the lawn and pitch up your hat, and I will hold you ten to one. I put a bullet into it every time at forty paces. No, sir, I consider you... Max, at window. Here, all of you. Look, here is Lady Gay Spanker coming across the lawn at a hand gallop. Sir Harcourt, running to window. Bless me, the horse is running away. Look how she takes that fence. There's a seat. Sir Harcourt comes down left center. Lady Gay Spanker, who may she be? Grace, down center. Gay Spanker, Sir Harcourt, my cousin and dearest friend, you must like her. It will be my devoir, since it is your wish, though it will be a hard task in your presence. I am sure she will like you. <laughs> I flatter myself. Who, and what is she? Glee. Glee made a living thing. Nature, in some frolic mood, shut up a merry devil in her eye, and, spiting art, stole joy's brightest harmony to thrill her laugh, which peals out sorrows now. Her cry rings loudest in the field, the very echo loves it best, and, as each hill attempts to ape her voice, earth seems to laugh that it made a thing so glad. Max left. I, the merriest minx I ever kissed. Lady Gay laughs without. Lady Gay without. Max! Come in, you mischievous puss. Enter James, right. Mr. Adolphus and Lady Gay Spanker. Exit. Enter Lady Gay, right. Fully equipped in writing habit, etc. <laughs> well, Governor, how are ye? I have been down five times, climbing up your stairs in my long clothes. How are you, Grace, dear? Kisses her. There. Don't fidget, Max. And there. Kisses him, right center. There's one for you. Sir Harcourt, left. Uh-huh. -hmm. Lady Gay, center. Oh, gracious. I didn't see you had visitors. Max, right. Permit me to introduce... 
across the center. Sir Harcourt Courtley, Lady Gay Spanker. Mr. Dazzle, Mr. Hamilton, Lady Gay Spanker. Sir Harcourt, aside. A devilish fine woman. Dazzle, aside to Sir Harcourt. She's a devilish fine woman. You mustn't think anything of the liberties I take with my old papa here. Bless him. Kisses him again. Oh, no. Aside. I only thought I should like to be in his place. I am so glad you have come, Sir Harcourt. Now we shall be able to make a decent figure at the heels of a hunt. Uh, does your ladyship hunt? Ha! Huh. I say, Governor, does my ladyship hunt? I rather flatter myself that I do hunt. Why, Sir Harcourt, one might as well live without laughing as without hunting. It's indigenous to humanity. Man was formed expressly to fit a horse. Are not hedges and ditches created for leaps? Of course. And I look upon foxes to be one of the most blessed dispensations of a benign providence. Yes, it's all very well in the abstract. So I tried it once. Once? Only once? Once, only once, and then the animal ran away with me. Why? You would not have him walk? Finding my society disagreeable, he instituted a series of kicks, with a view of removing the annoyance, but, aided by the united stays of the mane and tail, I frustrated his intentions. Or laugh. His next resolve, however, was more effectual, for he succeeded in rubbing me off against a tree. <laughs> How absurd you must have looked with your legs and arms in the air, like a shipwrecked tea table. Sir, I never looked absurd in my life. Ah, oh, it may be very amusing in relation, I dare say, but very unpleasant in effect. I pity you, Sir Harcourt. It was criminal in your parents to neglect your education so shamefully. Possibly, but be assured... I shall never break my neck awkwardly from a horse when it might be accomplished with less trouble from a bedroom window. Young Courtly, right, aside. My dad will get caught by this she Bucephalus tamer. Ah, Sir Harcourt, had you been here a month ago, you would have witnessed the most glorious run that ever swept over Merry England's green cheek. A steeplechase, sir, which I intended to win, but my horse broke down the day before. I had a chance, notwithstanding, and, but for Gay here, I should have won. How I regretted my absence from it. How did my filly behave herself, Gay? Gloriously, Max, gloriously. There were sixteen horses in the field, all metal to the bone. The start was a picture. Away we went in a cloud, pell-mell, helter-skelter, the fools first, as usual, using themselves up. We soon passed them first. First your kitty, then my blue skin, and Craven's coat last. Then came the tug. Kitty skimmed the walls, blue skin flew over the fences, the colt neck and neck, and half a mile to run. At last the colt balked a leap and went wild. Kitty and I had it all to ourselves. She was three lengths ahead as we breasted the last wall, six feet if an inch, and a ditch on the other side. Now, for the first time, I gave Blueskin his head. <laughs> Away he flew like a thunderbolt. Over went the filly, and I over the same spot, leaving Kitty in the ditch. Walked the steeple eight miles and thirty minutes, and scarcely turned a hair. Crosses right and left center. Bravo! Bravo! Bravo. Lady Gay, left center. Do you hunt? Dazzle, left. Hunt! I belong to a hunting family. I was born on horseback and cradled in a kennel. I, and I hope I may die with a woo-woo. Max, to Sir Harcourt. You must leave your town habits in the smoke of London. Here we rise with the lark. I haven't the remotest conception when that period is. Grace. Center. The man that misses sunrise misses the sweetest part of his existence. Oh, pardon me. I've seen sunrise frequently after a ball or from the windows of my travelling carriage, and I always considered it excessively disagreeable. 
I love to watch the first tear that glistens in the opening eye of morning, the silent song the flowers breathe, the thrilling choir of the woodland minstrels to which the modest brook trickles applause. These swelling out of the sweetest chord of sweet creation's matins seem to pour some soft and merry tale into the daylight's ear, as if the waking world had dreamed a happy thing, and now smiled o'er the telling of it. The effect of a rustic education. Who could ever discover music in a damp, foggy morning, except those confounded waits who never play in tune, and a miserable wretch who makes a point of crying coffee under my window just as I am persuading myself to sleep. In fact, I never heard any music worth listening to, except in Italy. No? Then you never heard a well-trained English pack in full cry? Full cry? Aye, there is harmony, if you will. Give me the trumpet nay, the spotted pack just catching scent. What a chorus is their yelp. The view, hallo, blent with a peal of free and fearless mirth. That's our English music. Match it where you can. Sir Harcourt, left center, aside. I must see about Lady Gay's banker. Dazzle, left, aside to Sir Harcourt. Ah, would you? Time then appears as young as love, and plumes as swift as a wing. Away we go. The earth flies back to aid our course. Horse, man, hound, earth, heaven, all, all one piece of glowing ecstasy. Then I love the world myself, and every living thing, my jocund soul cries out for very glee, as it could wish all creation had but one mouth, that I might kiss it. Goes up, center. Sir Harcourt, aside. I wish I were the mouth. Why, we will regenerate you, baronet. Dazzle, clapping his shoulder. I will regenerate you. Sir Harcourt angrily goes up and gets around to write. But, Gay, where is your husband? Where is Adolphus? Lady Gay, coming down. Bless me, where is my dolly? You are married, then. I have a husband somewhere, though I can't find him just now. Calls. Dolly, dear. Aside to Max. A governor at home, I always whistle when I want him. Enter Spanker, right upper entrance. Grace and Max meet him and shake hands. Here I am. Did you call me, Gay? Sir Harcourt, eyeing him. Is that your husband? Lady Gay, aside. Yes, bless his stupid face, that's my dolly. Permit me to introduce you to Sir Harcourt Courtly. Uh, how'd you do? I, um... Appears frightened. Lady Gay gets behind him, left center. Delighted to have the honor of making the acquaintance of a gentleman so highly celebrated in the world of fashion. Oh, yes, delighted, I'm sure. Quite, very, so, so delighted. Delighted. Gets quite confused, draws on his glove and tears it. Where have you been, Dolly? Oh, uh, I was just outside. Why did you not come in? I'm sure I didn't. I don't exactly know, but I thought as uh, perhaps... Uh, I can't remember. Shall we have the pleasure of your company to dinner? I always dine, usually. That is, unless Gay remains... Stay to dinner, of course. We came on purpose to stop three or four days with you. Will you excuse my absence, Gay? What? What? Where are you going? What takes you away? We must postpone the dinner until Gay is dressed. Oh, never mind. Stay where you are. No, I must go. I say you shan't. I will be king in my own house. Do, my dear uncle. Crosses. You shall be king, and I'll be your prime minister. That is, I'll rule, and you shall have the honor of taking the consequences. Exit left. Well said, Grace. Have your own way. It is the only thing we women ought to be allowed. Come, Gay. Dress for dinner. Sir Harcourt, right. Permit me, Lady Gay Spunker. Lady Gay, center. With pleasure. What do you want? To escort you. 
Oh, never mind. I can escort myself, thank you. And Dolly, too. Come, dear. Exit right. Au revoir. Ah, thank you. Exit awkwardly right. What an ill-assorted pair. Not a bit. She married him for freedom, and she has it. He married her for protection, and he has it. How he ever summoned courage to propose to her, I can't guess. Max takes his arm. Bless you, he never did. She proposed to him. She says he would if he could, but as he couldn't, she did it for him. <laughs> Excellent Max and Sir Harcourt, laughing through window right. Enter Cool with letter left. Cool left. Mr. Charles, I have been watching to find you alone. Sir Harcourt has ridden to town for you. Young Courtly, right. The devil he has. He expects you down tomorrow evening. Dazzle, center. Oh, he'll be punctual. A thought strikes me. Pooh, confound your thoughts. I can think of nothing but the idea of leaving Grace at the very moment when I had established the most... What if I can prevent her marriage with your governor? Impossible. He's pluming himself for the conquest of Lady Gay Spanker. It will not be difficult to make him believe she accedes to his suit. And if she would but join in the plan... I see it all. Do you think she would? I mistake my game if she would not. Here comes Sir Harcourt. I'll begin with him. Retire and watch how I'll open the campaign for you. Young Courtly and Cool retire. Enter Sir Harcourt by window right. Here is that cursed fellow again. Ah, my dear old friend. Mr. Dazzle. I have a secret of importance to disclose to you. Are you a man of honour? Hush, don't speak. You are. It is with the greatest pain I am compelled to request you, as a gentleman, that you will shun studiously the society of Lady Gay Spanker. Good gracious. Wherefore, and by what right do you make such a demand? Why, I am distantly related to the Spankers. Why, hang it, sir, you don't appear to be related to every family in Great Britain. A good many of the nobility claim me as a connection, but, to return, she is much struck with your address. Evidently, she laid herself out for display. Ha! You surprise me. To entangle you. Ha! <laughs> ha! Why, it did appear like it. You will spare her for my sake. Give her no encouragement. If disgrace come upon my relatives, the Spankers, I should never hold up my head again. Sir Harcourt, aside. I shall achieve an easy conquest and a glorious. <laughs> I never remarked it before, but this is a gentleman. May I rely on your generosity? Faithfully. Shakes his hand. Sir... I honour and esteem you, but might I ask, how came you to meet our friend, Max Harkaway, in my house in Belgrave Square? Re-enter, young courtly, sits on sofa at back, left. Certainly. I had an acceptance of your sons for one hundred pounds. Sir Harcourt, astonished. Of my sons? Impossible. Ah, sir, fact. He paid a debt for a poor unfortunate man. Fifteen children, half a dozen wives. The devil knows what all. Simple boy. Innocent youth, I have no doubt. When you have the hundred convenient, I shall feel delighted. Oh, follow me to my room, and if you have the documents, it will be happiness to me to pay it. Poor oh, Charles, good heart. Oh, a splendid heart, I dare say. Exit, Sir Harcourt, left. Come here, bring your splendid heart here, and write me the bill. Young Courtly, right at table. What for? What for? Why, to release the unfortunate man and his family, to be sure, from jail. Who is he? Yourself. But I haven't fifteen children. Will you take your oath of that? Nor four wives. More shame for you, with all that family. Come, don't be obstinate. Write and date it back. Aye, but where is the stamp? Here they are, of all patterns. Pulls out a pocket book. I keep them ready drawn in case of necessity, all but the date and acceptance. Now, if you are in an autographic humour, and you could try how your signature will look across half a dozen of them, there, right? Exactly. You know the place. Across. Good. And thank your lucky stars that you have found a friend at last. 
that gives you money and advice. Takes paper. I'll give the old gentleman this, and then you can relieve the necessities of your fifteen little unfortunates. Exit left. Things are approaching to a climax. I must appear in propria persona, and immediately, but I must first ascertain what the real sentiments of this riddle of a woman. Does she love me? I flatter myself. By Jove, here she comes. I shall never have such an opportunity again. Retires up, right. Enter Grace, left. I wish I had never seen Mr. Hamilton. Why does every object appear robbed of the charm it once presented to me? Why do I shudder at the contemplation of this marriage, which, till now, was to me a subject of indifference? Crosses, right. Am I in love? In love. If I am, my past life has been the work of raising up a pedestal to place my own folly on. I, the infidel, the railer. Young Courtly, advancing, left. Meditating upon matrimony, madam? Grace, aside. He thinks he was the subject of my meditations. Aloud. Uh, no, Mr. Hamilton, I... Young Courtly, aside. I must unmask my battery now. Grace, aside. How foolish I am. He will perceive that I tremble. I must appear at ease. A pause. Uh, uh, um... Ah. Uh. They sink into silence again. Aside. How very awkward. Young Courtly, aside. It's a very difficult subject to begin. Aloud. Uh, madam, ahem, there was, is, I mean, I was about to remark that I was about to observe a... Aside. Hang me if not a very slippery subject. I must brush up on my faculties. Attack her in her own way. Aloud. Sing, O oh muse. Aside. Why? I have made love before to a hundred women. Grace, aside. I wish I had something to do, for I have nothing to say. Madam, there is a subject so fraught with fate to my future life that you must pardon my lack of delicacy, should a too hasty expression mar the fervent courtesy of its intent. Pause. To you, I feel aware, I must appear in a light of a comparative stranger. Grace, aside. I know what's coming. Of you, I know perhaps too much for my own peace. Grace, aside. He is in love. I forget all that befell before I saw your beauteous self. I seem born into another world. My nature changed. The beams of that bright face falling on my soul have from its chaos warmed into life the flowers of affection, whose maiden odours now float toward the sun, pouring forth on their pure tongue a might of adoration midst the voices of a universe. Aside. That's something in her style. Mr. Hamilton. You cannot feel surprised. I am more than surprised. Aside. I am delighted. Do not speak so coldly. You have offended me. No, madam. No woman, whatever her state, can be offended by the adoration even of the meanest. It is myself whom I have offended and deceived. But still, I ask your pardon. Grace, aside. Oh, he thinks I am refusing him. Aloud. I am not exactly offended, but... Consider my position. A few days and an insurmountable barrier would have placed you beyond my wildest hopes. You would have been my mother. He starts up, annoyed at having betrayed himself. I should have been your mother. Aside. I thought so. No, that is, I meant Sir Harcourt Courtley's bride. Grace, with great emphasis. Never. How? Never? May I then hope? You turn away. You would not lacerate me by a refusal. Grace, aside. How stupid he is. Still silent. I thank you, Miss Grace. I ought to have expected this. Fool that I have been. One course alone remains. Farewell. Grace, aside. Now he's going. Farewell forever. Sits. Will you not speak one word? I shall leave this house immediately. I shall not see you again. Unhand me, sir. I insist. Young Courtly, aside. Oh, what an ass I've been. Rushes up to her and seizes her hand. Release this hand? Never, never! Kissing it. Never will I quit this hand. It shall be my companion in misery, in solitude, when you are far away. Oh, should anyone come... Drops her handkerchief. He stoops to pick it up. For heaven's sake, do not kneel. Young Courtly kneels. Forever thus prostrate before my souled saint, I will lead a pious life of eternal adoration. Should we be discovered thus, pray, Mr. Hamilton, pray, pray. Pray? I am praying. What more can I do? Your conduct is shameful. It is. Rises. And if I do not scream, it is not for your sake, that... But it might alarm the family. It might. It would. Say, I am wholly indifferent to you. 
I entreat one word. I implore you, do not withdraw your hand. She snatches it away. He puts his arm around her waist. You smile. Leave me, dear Mr. Hamilton. Dear. Then I am dear to you. That word once more. Say, say you love me. Is this fair? He catches her in his arms and kisses her. Enter Lady Gay Spanker, right? Ha! Huh. Oh! Gay! Destruction! Exit. Left. Physic! The devil! Don't mind me, pray. Don't let me be in an interruption. I was just... Yes, I see you were. Oh, madam, how could you mar my bliss in the very ecstasy of its fulfillment? I always like to be in at the death. Never drop your ears, bless you. She's only a little fresh. Give her her head, and she will outrun herself. Possibly. What am I to do? Keep your seat. But in a few days she will take a leap that must throw me. She marries Sir Harcourt courtly. Why, that is awkward, certainly. But you can challenge and shoot him. Unfortunately, that is out of the question. How so? You will not betray a secret if I inform you. All right. What is it? I am his son. What? His son? But he does not know you? No, I met him here by chance and faced it out. I never saw him before in my life. <laughs> Beautiful. I see it all. You're in love with your mother that should be, your wife that will be. Now, I think I could distance the old gentleman if you will but lend us to your assistance. I will. In anything. You must know then that my father, Sir Harcourt, has fallen desperately in love with you. With me? <laughs> Utters a scream of delight. That is delicious. <laughs> now, if you could only... Could? I will. <laughs> I see my cue. I'll cross his scent. I'll draw him after me. <laughs> Won't I make love to him? <laughs> the only objection might be Mr. Spanker, who might... No, he mightn't. He has no objection, bless him. He's an inestimable little character. You don't know him as well as I do, I dare say. <laughs> dinner bell rings. Here they come to dinner. I'll commence my operations on your governor immediately. <laughs> How I shall enjoy it. Be guarded. Enter Max Harkaway, right. Sir Harcourt, left. Dazzle, right. Grace and Spanker left. Now, gentlemen, Sir Harcourt, do you lead Grace? I believe Sir Harcourt is engaged to me. Takes his arm. Well, please yourselves. They file out, left. Max first, young Courtly and Grace. Sir Harcourt coquetting with Lady Gay, leaving Dazzle, who offers his arm to Spanker and walks on. Spanker runs after him, trying to take it. Curtain. End of Act 3. Act 5. Scene. The same. Enter Cool. Left. This is the most serious affair Sir Harcourt has ever been engaged in. I took the liberty of considering him a fool when he told me I was going to marry. But voluntarily to incur another man's encumbrance is very little short of madness. If he continues to conduct himself in this absurd manner, I shall be compelled to dismiss him. Enter Sir Harcourt, right, equipped for travelling. Cool. Sir Harcourt. Is my chariot in waiting? For the last half hour at the park wicket. But pardon the insinuation, sir. Would it not be more advisable to hesitate a little for a short reflection before you undertake the heavy responsibility of a woman? No, hesitation destroys the romance of a faux palm and reduces it to the level of a mere mercantile calculation. What is to be done with Mr. Charles? I, much against my will, Lady Gay prevailed on me to permit him to remain. You, cool, must return him to college. Pass through London and deliver these papers. Here is a small notice of the coming elopement for the morning post. This by an eyewitness for the Herald, this with all the particulars for the Chronicle, and the full and circumstantial account for the evening journals, after which meet us at Boulogne. Very good, Sir Harcourt. Going left. Lose no time. Remember, Hotel Anglais, Boulogne-sur-Mer. 
and cool bring a few copies with you and don't forget to distribute some amongst my very particular friends it shall be done exit left with what indifference does a man of the world view the approach of the most perilous catastrophe my position hazardous as it is entails none of that nervous excitement which a neophyte in the school of fashion would feel i am as cool and steady as possible habit habit oh how many roses will fade upon the cheek of beauty when the defalcation of sir harcourt courtly is whispered then hinted at last confirmed and bruited i think i see them then on my return they will not dare reject me i am their sovereign whoever attempts to think of treason i'll banish him from the west end i'll cut him i'll put him out of fashion enter lady gay right sir harcourt at your feet i had hoped you would have repented repented have you not come to say it was a jest say you have love is too sacred a subject to be trifled with come let us fly see i have procured disguises my courage begins to fail me let me return impossible where do you intend to take me you shall be my guide the carriage waits you will never desert me desert oh heavens nay do not hesitate flight now alone is left to your desperate situation come every moment is laden with danger they are going right oh gracious hush what is it i have forgotten i must return impossible i must i must i have left max a pet staghound in his basket without whom life would be unendurable i could not exist no no let him be sent to us in a, a hamper in a hamper remorseless man go you love me not how would you like to be sent after me in a hamper let me fetch him hark i hear him squeal oh max max hush for heaven's sake they'll imagine you're calling the squire i hear footsteps where can i retire goes up right enter metal spanker dazzle and max left lady gay screams spanker versus courtly i subpoena every one of you as witnesses i have em ready here they are shilling a piece giving them round where is sir harcourt there bear witness call on the vile delinquent for protection oh his protection what ha huh. i'll swear i overheard the whole elopement planned before any jury where's the book to lady gay do you hear you profligate <laughs> but where is this wretched lothario ay where is the defendant where lies the hoary villain what villain that will not serve you i'll not be blinded that way we won't be blinded any way i must seek sir harcourt and demand an explanation such a thing never occurred in oak hall before it must be cleared up exit right metal aside to spanker now take my advice remember your gender mind the notes i have given you spanker left center aside all right here they are now madam i have procured the highest legal opinion on this point metal left here here and the question resolves itself into a uh, into uh, what's this looks at notes a nutshell yes we are in a nutshell will you in every respect subscribe to my requests desires commands looks at notes orders imperative indicative in injunctive or otherwise lady gay aside upon my life he's actually going to assume the ribbons and take the box seat i must put a stop to this i will to spanker 
Mr. Spanker, I have been insulted by Sir Harcourt Courtley. He tried to elope with me. I place myself under your protection. Challenge him. Dazzle, right? Oh, I smell powder. I know it will end in smoke. Sir Harcourt would rather run than fight. Command my services. My dear madam, can I be of any use? Oh, a challenge. I must consult my legal adviser. No, impossible. Crosses, right centre. Pooh, the easiest thing in life. Leave it to me. What has an attorney to do with affairs of honour? They are out of his element. Compromise the question. Pull his nose. We have no objection to that. Dazzle, turning to Lady Gay. Well, we have no objection either, have we? No. Pull his nose. That will be something. And, moreover, it is not exactly actionable. Isn't it? Thank you. I'll note down that piece of information. It may be useful. How? Cheated out of my legal knowledge. Crosses to Dazzle, who signifies he will pull his nose. Metal hastily gets back to left. Lady Gay crosses to left center. Mr. Spanker, I am determined. I insist upon a challenge being sent to Sir Harcourt Courtley. And, mark me, if you refuse to fight him, I will. Don't. Take my advice, you'll incapacitate. Look you, Mr. Meddle, unless you wish me to horsewhip you, hold your tongue. What a she-tiger. I shall retire and collect my costs. Exit left. Mr. Spanker, oblige me by writing as I dictate. Don't go. Oh, he's gone. And now I am defenceless. Is this the fate of husbands? A duel? Is this the result of becoming master of my own family? Come, Dolly. I won't be dollied. Sits left center. Dazzle wheels him round to left table and sits on the arm of the chair. Sir, the situation in which you were discovered with my wife admits of neither explanation nor apology. Oh, yes, but it does. I don't believe you really intended to run quite away. You do not, but I know better. I say I did. And if it had not been for your unfortunate interruption, I do not know where I might have been by this time. Go on. Nor apology. I'm writing my own death warrant, committing suicide on compulsion. The bearer? That will be you. I am the bearer. We'll arrange all preliminary matters. For another day must see this sacrilege expiated by your life or that of uh, the bearer. No. Yours very sincerely. Looking at Dazzle. Very sincerely. Lady Gay and Dazzle repeat very sincerely, which Spanker repeats in astonishment. Dolly Spanker. Dolly? No, no. Oh, Adolphus Spanker. Now. Mr. Dazzle. Gives the letter over his head. The document is as sacred as if it were a hundred pound bill. We trust to your discretion. His discretion? Oh, put your head in a tiger's mouth and trust to his discretion. Sealing letter, etc., with Spanker's seal. My dear Lady Gay, matters of this kind are indigenous to my nature independently of their pervading fascination to all humanity. But this is the more especially delightful, as you may perceive, I shall be the intimate and bosom friend of both parties. Is it not the only alternative in such a case? It is a beautiful panacea in any, in every case. Going, returns. By the way, where would you like this party of pleasure to come off? Open air shooting is pleasant enough, but if I might venture to advise, we could order half a dozen of that Madeira and a box of cigars into the billiard room, so make a night of it. Eh, Mr. Spanker? I don't smoke. Take up the irons every now and then, string for the first shot, and blaze away at one another in an amicable and gentlemanlike way. 
so conclude the matter before the potency of the liquor could disturb the individuality of the object, or the smoke of the cigars render the outline dubious. Does such an arrangement coincide with your views? Perfectly. I trust shortly to be the harbinger of happy tidings. Exit left. Spanker crosses. Lady Gay Spanker, are you ambitious of becoming a widow? Why, Dolly, woman is at best weak, and weeds become mare. Female, am I to be immolated on the altar of your vanity? If you become pathetic, I shall laugh. You are laughing? Farewell, base, heartless, unfeeling woman. Exit left. Oh, well, so I am. I am heartless, for he is a good, dear little fellow, and I ought not to play upon his feelings, but upon my life he sounds so well up at concert pitch that I feel disinclined to untune him. Poor doll, I didn't think he cared so much about me. I will put him out of pain. Exit left. Sir Harcourt comes down from window. I have been a fool, a dupe to my own vanity. I shall be pointed at as a ridiculous old coxcomb, and so I am. The hour of conviction has arrived. Have I deceived myself? Have I turned all my senses inwards, looking towards self? Always self. And has the world been ever laughing at me? Well... If they have, I shall revert to the joke. They may say I'm an old ass, but I will prove that I am neither too old to repent my folly, nor such an ass as to flinch from confessing it. A blow half met is but half felt. Enter Dazzle, left. Sir Harcourt, may I be permitted the honour of a few minutes' conversation with you? With pleasure. Have the kindness to throw your eye over that. Gives letter. Sir Harcourt reads. Situation. My wife. Apology. Expiate. My life. Why? This is intended for a challenge. Why? I'm perfectly aware that it is not quite en règle in the couching, for with that I had nothing to do, but I trust that the irregularity of the composition will be confounded in the beauty of the subject. Mr. Dazzle, are you in earnest? Sir Harcourt Courtly, upon my honour I am, and I hope that no previous engagement will interfere with an immediate reply in propria persona. We have fixed upon the billiard room as the scene of action, which I have just seen properly illuminated in honour of the occasion. And, by the by, if your implements are not handy, I can oblige you with a pair of the sweetest things you ever handled, hair-triggered, sore grip, heirlooms in my family. I regard them almost in the light of relations. Sir. I shall avail myself of one of your relatives. Aside. One of the hereditaments of my folly. I must accept it. Aloud. So, I shall be happy to meet Mr. Spanker at any time or place he may appoint. The sooner the better, sir. Allow me to offer you my arm. I see you understand these matters. My friend Spanker is woefully ignorant. Miserably uneducated. Exeunt left. Re-enter Max with Grace right. Max left. Give ye joy, girl. Give ye joy. Sir Harcourt Courtly must consent to waive all title to your hand in favor of his son Charles. Grace right. Oh, indeed. Is that the pitch of your congratulations? Huff. The exchange of an old fool for a young one? Pardon me if I am not able to distinguish the advantage. Advantage? Moreover, by what right am I a transferable cipher in the family of Courtly? So, then my fate is reduced to this, to sacrifice my fortune or unite myself with a worm-eaten edition of the classics. Why, he certainly is not such a fellow as I could have chosen for my little grace. But consider, to retain fifteen thousand a year... 
Now, tell me honestly. But why should I say honestly? Speak, girl. Would you rather not have the lad? Why do you ask me? Why, look ye. I'm an old fellow. Another hunting season or two, and I shall be in at my own death. I can't leave you this house and land, because they are entailed. Nor can I say I am sorry for it, for it is a good law. But I have a little box with my grace's name upon it, where, since your father's death and miserly will, I have yearly placed a certain sum to be yours, should you refuse to fulfill the conditions prescribed. My own dear uncle. Clasping him round the neck. Pooh, pooh. What's to do now? Why, it was only a trifle. Why, you little rogue, what are you crying about? Nothing, but... But what? Come out with it. Will you have young courtly? Re-enter Lady Gay, left. Oh, Max! Max! Why, what's amiss with you? I'm a wicked woman. What have you done? Everything. Oh, I thought Sir Harcourt was a coward, but now I find that a man may be a coxcomb without being a poltroon, just to show my husband how inconvenient it is to hold the ribbon some time. I made him send a challenge to the old fellow, and he, to my surprise, accepted it, and is going to blow my dolly's brains out in the billiard room. The devil! Just what I imagined, I had got my whip-hand of him again. Out comes my linchpin, and over I go. Oh. I will soon put a stop to that. A duel under my roof. Murder in Oak Hall. I'll shoot them both. Exit left. Are you really in earnest? Do you think it looks like a joke? Oh, Dolly, if you allow yourself to be shot, I will never forgive you. Never. Oh, he is a great fool, Grace. But I can tell you why I would sooner lose my bridal hand than he should be hurt on my account. Two shots are fired without. Left. Enter Sir Harcourt. Left. Tell me. Tell me. Have you shot him? Is he dead? My dear Sir Harcourt. You horrid old root! Have you killed him? I shall never forgive myself. Exit left. Grace, right. Oh, Sir Harcourt, what has happened? Sir Harcourt, left. Don't be alarmed, I beg. Your uncle interrupted us, discharged the weapons, locked the challenger in the billiard room to cool his rage. Thank heaven. Miss Grace, to apologize for my conduct were useless. More especially as I am confident that no feelings of indignation or sorrow for my late acts are cherished by you. But still, reparation is in my power, and I not only waive all title, right, or claim to your person or your fortune, but freely admit your power to bestow them on a more worthy object. This generosity, Sir Harcourt, is most unexpected. No, not generosity, but simply justice. Justice. May I still beg a favour? Claim anything that is mine to grant. You have been duped by Lady Gay Spanker. I have also been cheated and played upon by her and Mr. Hamilton. May I beg that the contract between us may, to all appearances, be still held good? Certainly. Though I confess I cannot see the point of your purpose. Enter Max with young Courtly left. Now, Grace, I have brought the lad. Thank you, uncle, but the trouble was quite unnecessary. Sir Harcourt holds to his original contract. The deuce he does. And I am willing, nay, eager, to become Lady Courtly. Young Courtly aside. The deuce you are. But, Sir Harcourt. Oh, one word, Max, for an instant. They retire, off right, young courtly, aside. What can this mean? Can it be possible that I have been mistaken, that she is not in love with Augustus Hamilton? Grace, aside. Now we shall find how he intends to bend the haughty grace. Madam, miss, I mean, are you really in earnest? Are you in love with my father? No, indeed I am not. Are you in love with anyone else? No, or I should not marry him. Then you actually accept him as your husband? 
in the common acceptation of the word. Young Courtly, aside. Hang me if I have not been a pretty fool. Aloud. Why do you marry him if you don't care about him? To save my fortune. Young Courtly, aside. Mercenary, cold-hearted girl. Aloud. Were you never in love? Never. Young Courtly, aside. Oh, what an ass I've been. Aloud. I heard Lady Gay mention something about a Mr. Hamilton. Ah, uh, yes. A person who, after an acquaintanceship of two days, had the assurance to make love to me, and I... Yes, you well? I pretended to receive his attentions. Young Courtly, aside. It was the best pretense I ever saw. An absurd, vain, conceited coxcomb, who appeared to imagine that I was so struck with his fulsome speech that he could turn me round his finger. Young Courtly, aside. My very thoughts. But he was mistaken. Young Courtly, aside. Confoundedly. Aloud. Yet you seemed rather concerned about the news of his death. His accident? No, but... But what? Grace, aside. What can I say? Aloud. Ah, but my maid, Pert's brother, is a postboy, and I thought he might have sustained an injury, poor boy. Young Courtly, aside. Curse the postboy. Aloud. Madam. If the retention of your fortune be the plea on which you are about to bestow your hand on the one you do not love, and whose very actions speak his carelessness with that inestimable jewel that he is incapable of appreciating, know that I am devotedly, madly attached to you. You, sir? Impossible. Not at all, but inevitable. I have been so for a very long time. Why, you never saw me until last night. I have seen you in imagination. You are the ideal I have worshipped. Since you press me into a confession, which nothing but this could bring me to speak, no, I did love poor Augustus Hamilton. Re-enter Max and Sir Harcourt, right. But he, he is no more. Pray spare me, sir. Young Courtly, aside. She loves me, and oh, here's my governor again. What a situation I am in. What is to be done? Enter Lady Gay, left. Where have you put my dolly? I have been racing all round the house. Tell me, is he quite dead? I'll have him brought in. Exit left. Sir Harcourt, right. My dear madam, you must perceive this unfortunate occurrence was no fault of mine. I was compelled to act as I have done. I was willing to offer any, any apology, but that resource was excluded as unacceptable. I know, I know. "'Twas I made him write that letter. "'There was no apology required. "'Twas I that apparently seduced you from the prowls of propriety. "'Twas all a joke, and here is the end of it.' "'Enter Max, Spanker, and Dazzle left. "'Oh, if he had but lived to say, I forgive you, Gay.' "'So I do.' "'Lady Gay, seeing Spanker. "'Ah, he is alive.' "'Of course I am.' <laughs> embraces him i will never hunt again unless you wish it sell your stable no no do what you like say what you like for the future i find the head of a family has less ease and more responsibility than i as a member could have anticipated i abdicate they go up his arm round her waist, hers on his shoulder. Enter Cool, left. Ah, Cool, here. Aside to Cool. You may destroy those papers. I have altered my mind, and I do not intend to elope at present. Where are they? As you seem particular, Sir Harcourt, I sent them off by the mail to London. Why, then a full description of the whole affair will be published tomorrow. Most irretrievably. You must post to town immediately and stop the press. I beg pardon, but they would see me hanged first, Sir Harcourt. They don't frequently meet with such a profitable lie. James, without. No, sir. No, sir. Enter James, left. Sir, there's a gentleman who calls himself Mr. Solomon Isaacs, insists upon following me up. Exit, left. Enter Mr. Solomon Isaacs, left. Mr. Courtley, will you excuse my performance? of a most disagreeable duty at any time, but more especially in such a manner. I must beg the honour of your company to town. What? How? What for? Isaacs, left centre. 
for death, Sir Harcourt. Sir Harcourt, center. Arrested? Impossible. Here must be some mistake. Not the slightest, sir. Judgment has been given in five cases for the last three months. But Mr. Courtley is an eel rather too nimble for my men. We have been on his track and traced him down to this village with Mr. Dazzle. Dazzle, right. Ah, Isaacs, how are you? Thank you, sir. Speaks to Sir Harcourt. Max, left. Do you know him? Oh, intimately. Distantly related to his family. Same arms on our escutcheon. Empty purse, falling through a hole in a pocket. Motto, requiescat in parquet, which means, let virtue be its own reward. Sir Harcourt to Isaacs. Oh, I thought there was a mistake. Know to your misfortune that Mr. Howelson was the person you dogged to Oak Hall, between whom and my son a most remarkable likeness exists. Ha, ha. No to your misfortune, Sir Harcourt, that Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Courtley are one and the same person. Charles. Young Courtley, up centre. Concealment is in vain. I am Augustus Hamilton. Hang me, if I didn't think it all along. Oh, you infernal cousining dog. Crosses to him. Uh, now then, Mr. Courtley. Grace, centre. Stay, sir. Mr. Charles Courtley is under age. Ask his father. Uh, um, I won't. I won't pay a shilling of the rascal's debts, not a sixpence. Then I will. You may retire. Exit. Isaacs. Left. I can now perceive the generous point of your conduct towards me, and believe me, I appreciate and will endeavour to deserve it. Max crosses. <laughs> Come, Sir Harcourt. You have been fairly beaten. You must forgive him. Say you will. So, so, it appears you have been leading covertly an infernal town life. Young Courtly, center. Yes, please, father. Imitating Master Charles. None of your humbug, sir. Aside. He is my own son. How could I expect him to keep out of the fire? Aloud. And you, Mr. Cool, have you been deceiving me? Cool, right. Oh, Sir Harcourt, if your perception was played upon, how could I be expected to see? Pause. He goes up and off left. Well, it would be useless to withhold my hand. There, boy. He gives his hand to young Courtley, left. Grace comes down on the right side and offers her hand. He takes it. What is all this? What do you want? Your blessing, father. If you please, father. Aho! Uh -huh. The mystery is being solved. So, so, you young scoundrel, you have been making love under the rose. Lady Gay, left center. He learned that from you, Sir Harcourt. Ahem. Uh -huh. What would you do now if I were to withhold my consent? Do without it. The will says, if Grace marries anyone but you, her property reverts to your heir apparent. And there he stands. Make a virtue of necessity. Spanker, right. I married from inclination. And see how happy I am. And if ever I have a son... Hush, Dolly, dear. Well, take her, boy, although you are too young to marry. They retire with Max. Am I forgiven, Sir Harcourt? Uh, um, why, a... Eh? Aside. Have you really deceived me? Can you not see through this? And you still love me? As much as I ever did. Sir Harcourt is about to kiss her hand when Spanker interposes between them. A, a very handsome ring indeed. Very... Puts her arm in his, and they go up to Dazzle. Poor little Spanker. Max, coming down left, aside to Sir Harcourt. One point I wish to have settled. Who is Mr. Dazzle? Sir Harcourt, center. A relative of the Spankers, he told me. Oh, no. A near connection of yours. Never saw him before I came down here in all my life. To young Courtly. Charles, who is Mr. Dazzle? Who? I don't know. Dazzle. Dazzle. Dazzle comes right. Will you excuse an impertinent question? Dazzle, right. Certainly. Who the deuce are you? I have not the remotest idea. Oh, a simple question, as you may think it. It would puzzle half the world to answer. One thing I can vouch. 
Nature made me a gentleman. That is, I live on the best that can be procured for credit. I never spend my own money when I can oblige a friend. I'm always thick on the winning horse. I am an epidemic on the trade of tailor. For further particulars, inquire of any sitting magistrate. And these are the deeds which attest your title to the name of gentleman. I perceive you have caught the infection of the present age. Charles, permit me as your father, and you, sir, as his friend, to correct you on one point. Barefaced assurance is the vulgar substitute for gentlemanly ease, and there are many who, by aping the vices of the great, imagine that they elevate themselves to the rank of those whose faults alone they copy. No, sir, the title of gentleman is the only one out of any monarch's gift, yet within the reach of every peasant. It should be engrossed by truth, stamped with honour, sealed with good feeling, signed man, and enrolled in every true young English heart. Curtain End of Act 5 End of London Assurance